even though his enemies would respect him in the idea that many of them would keep their trusts with him. On the night that he left Mecca, 13 years he was in Mecca, 10 years he was in Medina. On the night that he left Mecca, he left Ali ibn Abi Talib behind to sleep in his bed. Was that the only role of Ali ibn Abi Talib? No. Ali ibn Abi Talib had a second role. Oh Ali, after you have left my bed, the next day, return the trusts of my enemies that they entrusted with me. Imagine the enemies of Quraysh would say to the Prophet Muhammad, we don't believe in you, we hate you, we think you're crazy. Do you mind looking after our gold necklace for us? Because it was an ethical trait where even though the person is my enemy, I as a prophet of God have not come to make enemies. If I can show that I am trustworthy, let my enemies deposit with me. Therefore, after Mecca 13 years, he moved on to Medina. And the fifth important area when he left after 13 years, at the age of 53, when he went to Medina, when they fought him in his battles, many people would come and say, Muhammad spread his religion by the sword. Whereas the reality is those battles that occurred were defensive battles and they were not offensive. If they were offensive, then you could say that he spread the religion by the sword. Whereas on the contrary, they were what? They were defensive battles. Were they defensive battles to protect Muslims only? No. The Quran came forward in chapter 22, verse 39 to 40 saying what? Were it not for us telling our Prophet to come out and protect himself, there would not be a single church, synagogue or mosque in existence in Arabia. I ask you, if this Prophet came to spread his religion by the sword, why is the Quran talking about churches and synagogues? Chapter 22, verse 39 to 40. Were it not for our Prophet defending himself, there wouldn't be a single church, synagogue or mosque. The reason is Islam was trying to say, when we are defending ourselves in Medina, we are looking to defend every single area of worship which says there is only one God. It's not just for us. The Quran would come with a statement. Say, O people of the book, قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ تَعَالَوْا O people of the book, O Jews, O Christians, come! We don't want to fight you. Muhammad's original message was, we don't want to fight the people of the book. O people of the book, come to a joint word between us and you. Chapter 3, verse 64. That we will only worship one God, we will not put partners to God, and we will not take lawgivers besides God. God. After those early battles, you even notice a focus in his message on education. That after the battle of Badr, when he takes those prisoners, some of his companions say to him quite recklessly, let's kill them. He says, no. Let's treat them with the best of treatment and let's say to them something. They say, what is it? He says, we will ransom them if they teach 10 of our people how to read and write. From the beginning, it was a message in Medina on a focus on education. Seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave. Today's Muslims seek knowledge from the cradle till marriage. After that, become lazy. Seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave. Read until the final moments of your life. The value of a believer is what? Is their knowledge? Is their wisdom? You notice what does he do? He doesn't want the prisoners tortured. No. If you can teach reading and writing, then these are the basis of a great society. Then after that, in establishing himself as the head of the state, in Medina, does he say the Jews should be kicked out or the Christians should be kicked out? No, he forms a constitution called the Constitution of Medina. The Jews will worship in their synagogues, the Christians will worship in their churches, and the Muslims will worship in their mosques. There is nothing wrong with having a society of multi-religious dimensions. And even after that in Medina, when he is ordered by his Lord to go to Mecca, he hasn't returned to Mecca since he was expelled. When he returns to Mecca, his companions say, let's go back and fight those Meccans. He says, no, we will conduct a peace treaty with them. His companions say to him, what do you mean peace treaty? Surely it is our chance to destroy these people's lives, to finish them like they tortured us, like they finished us, they killed us. The Prophet said, no, 
let's have a peace treaty with them and allow them to be opened up to the mercy of the religion of Islam. And that's why, do you know when the Prophet opened Mecca, he taught us an ethical lesson like the ethics of removing racism, like the ethics of respecting other religions, like the ethics of respecting the other gender. He taught us the ethical lesson by the name of forgiveness. Many Muslims find it hard to forgive today. A person who wrongs me or a person I see committing wrong, I find it hard to forgive them. You tell them, but the years have gone. Maybe the person changed. Maybe the person repented. No, I saw the person do this or the person said this and I'll never forgive them. Whereas their prophet was the most forgiving of men. When Mecca was opened, there were two men who came towards him who he forgave, who me and you would never forgive. The first of them was Wahshi, the man who mutilated the body of his uncle Hamza. Imagine your uncle who brought you up alongside Abu Talib. You saw his body mutilated by this man. To the extent, what do you know what Hind, the mother of Muawiyah did? She cut so many pieces of Hamza's body, she made a necklace for herself. And this Wahshi ripped Hamza's chest apart. When Mecca was opened, Wahshi, Abu Sufyan, Hind, people like Habbar ibn al-Aswad, they thought to themselves, we're never going to get forgiven by Muhammad. Muhammad's going to enter Mecca and he's going to execute us for what we did. Wahshi and Habbar said, but we hear Muhammad a man of mercy and that his religion is merciful and forgiving. He came to perfect the akhlaq of man. I have come to perfect the morals of mankind. So they said, let us go and approach him. Wahshi went to him. When Wahshi came, he said, O oh, Prophet of God, forgive me. I was in the days of ignorance. I didn't know about the message of Islam. I heard rumors, but it weren't true. Oh, Prophet of God, forgive me for what has happened. And the reply was, Oh, Wahshi, you are forgiven. Now leave this area. Then Al-Habbar ibn Al-Aswad came. Do you know what Al-Habbar ibn Al-Aswad did? The Prophet, one of his daughters, or in some narration, stepdaughter Zainab, she was pregnant. She was meant to go towards Medina. Al-Habbar wanted her to miscarry. So on her way towards Medina, he came and scared her in a way where she ended up miscarrying her child. When the Prophet heard this, he was saddened. When he opened Mecca, Al-Habbar came and he said, O oh, Prophet of God, I am the cause of the miscarriage of your grandchild. I scared your daughter in a way where I caused her to miscarry her child. But I was ignorant. They deceived me about your behavior and your character. When I see you now, I see a man of morals. Please allow me to be forgiven. The Prophet, if it was me and you, and someone hurt us in this way, would we forgive them? Ask yourself as Muslims today, how forgiving are we of our brothers, our sisters, our aunties, our uncles, our grandparents, our cousins? Whereas our Prophet came and taught even this man who caused my daughter to miscarry, he told him, you are forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do not worry over what you have done. And that's why his focus would also be that the basis of a great community is all of these ethics of tolerance and patience and forgiveness especially patience. You think as, as, as Muslims today, we have to be patient? We take it from him. Some of us have to be patient in our marriages. Some of us have to be patient with our children. You find he had to be patient with his marriages and with his children. With his marriages, would you believe he had married a lady by the name of Shamba? This Shamba, the narration says she was called Shamba, the daughter of Amr al Ghaffariya. This Shamba, when she saw his son Ibrahim die, we know he had Qasim, Abdullah, Tahir, and Ibrahim. You know, when she saw his son Ibrahim die, she was his wife. She saw his son die. She looked at him. She said, if you're really a prophet of God, God would not have caused your son to die. I'm leaving you. And she left. Do you know how much patience you have to have when you're married to someone and they talk like that to you? For you to tolerate. But he was patient. He had another wife by the name of Malika. 
This Malika heard some people say, your dad, the cause of his death was Muhammad. She said, take all your possessions. She left. Sometimes in our lives, we say, look what we face. Your prophet had to face more. Your own prophet had to face more. But he used to say, patience is to faith like the head is to the body. There can be no body without a head and there can be no faith without patience. Even he had to see a loss of his children. His son Ibrahim died, his son Qasim died, his son Abdullah died. Some of us today say, how comes our children died? How comes my friend's children died? When we say Rasulullah is an uswa and examples because everything that we face, the Prophet faced in his life as well. And that's why before he died, he did what any great leader will do. He made it clear to his people that even though I am dying, I will first ensure that I leave behind guidance for you. He left behind guidance on the day of Ghadir when he raised the hand of Ali. And he made it clear to the people that I will never leave this world without ensuring that there is a guide for you who continues to protect the message in the way I gave you the message.